much at Easter's, I am going to make no bones about this. I struggled during the international break. It's been 12 pretty dark days, only really brightened up by Maguire's own goal against Scotland. But thankfully, now club football's back. And I'm on a Cockney Odyssey again to bring you City playing away at West Ham. Okay, Matanistas, as always, food before football. And if you remember last season, on the opening day, of course, I came to West Ham, had to sit in the home end. But before that, I took you to a very traditional East London establishment serving jelly deals, pie mash and liquor. Today, we're going for something a little more cosmopolitan in the centre, but it's a type of cuisine that you're probably not familiar with, or at least most of you won't be. It's hard to find. It's gaining traction in the UK but for me it's really tasty really meaty so let's go for a Korean pre-match lunch and I'll admit I haven't been to this restaurant before called Koba but my nose and my reading of the reviews tells me that this is going to be a good place thank you So most Korean restaurants in the UK actually barbecue meat for you and since the main component or the most popular form of eating Korean food is a barbecue, it is a pleasure to have it served here as one would in Asia barbecued at the table on a hot plate. And as you saw there was a lunch set which looked like very good value but we're here for the meat and the barbecue. We've gone for fairly seafoody starters, so a glass of Vyogne to wet my whistle. I'm going to pronounce myself Matt Spit. Oh, come on, City. Right, dish one has arrived already. Quick slurp to cleanse the palate. So, before the main event of the meat, we have calamari with a couple of Korean dips. And just to make sure that I'm fully match fit today, we have a bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape red wine as well. And I'm not drinking and eating this alone. My friend Neeraj, who you've seen in previous videos, is with me. And hopefully another friend of mine who's going to the game will turn up and will be three. Right, this red dip looks like the spicier of the two. Nice enough dip, but to be honest, it's just a bit like the calamari you get in most restaurants. And now for the mayo. The mayo is nice, but I put it to you, this is probably not the most authentic Korean dish they have on the menu. Everything else we ordered is. And also on the table now, kimchi pancake. Here, we have it stuffed with seafood. It can come plain or with meat or with seafood or whatever. And for those who don't know, kimchi is fermented Korean vegetables. Mostly cabbage, but I've seen it with radish, cucumber and other vegetables. A lot of people don't like it, luckily I do, and it can be quite spicy. Let's give that a dip. I don't know what the dip is, probably sesame based. A little bit spicy and the seafood doesn't overwhelm the pancake which is not what you want you want to taste the pancake and the spice so all well and good so far matanistas bring the meat on now 
on to the main event. The main event being the meat barbecue. We ordered the set because it's got loads of goodies in it. And the waitress has just bought the hot plate, fired up the gas, greased the plate, and voila. There we have it. And hopefully in about half an hour's time, this will be totally wrecked with meat juices and bits of meat stuck to the hot plate. But so, so this was the ribeye, was it? And that's the pork belly, chicken, prawns and squid and oh yes, that's the beef rib, isn't it? Yeah, lovely. Does that get to start with the ribeye? Yes, go ahead. And to wrap the meat, we have lettuce, spring onion and the Korean, I think it's red bean or hot pepper paste, should be spicy. And given the meat's come, I won't be needing this anymore, so I'd better deal with it. And now a quick quality control on the red, which Nero just shows me is decent. Yep, it is indeed, and the temperature's decent as well, thankfully. Probably quite tricky with all these hot plates being heated up in there. So, I've loaded up a lettuce leaf, took the smallest lettuce leaf, and far too much meat with it, but I put the spring onions and sauce in. Give the meat a bit of a dunk in this sauce. Although, if I remember correctly, I think you add that sauce, the two little sauces, when you're having the meat on its own, and the red pepper paste when you're having a lettuce-style wrap. It's all coming thick and fast here. This is the spicy pork bibimbap, which is the most famous non-barbecue dish in Korean cuisine. There's a fried egg on top and you mix the meat, carrots, the rice and the hot pepper paste together to get a really delectable spicy rice creation. And of course it's cooked in like a hot stone bowl if that makes any sense, it's probably not even good English. But when it all comes together it's so nice you end up scraping the rice off the bottom. Base is fully loaded here. Excellent. Yeah. So the beef ribs were cut with a pair of scissors. The scissors over there. And they were barbecued until they were about medium well. And they don't mess about here. The pork belly's gone on already. I mean, we've got tons of meat to wade through here. Now, all the meat, of course, has been marinated well in advance. You can see some of the sauces on top of the big meat platter, with the exception of the belly pork, which hasn't been marinated. Anyway, here we are with a massively overloaded lettuce wrap. Oh, yeah. That is delectable, that is. I think I had a mixture of meats there, but the rib is the massive winner. Entirely slurp worthy, I must say. And cometh the hour, cometh one of the most important ingredients in Korean cuisine, the kimchi, the spicy fermented vegetables. Cabbage, cucumber, radish. And I have to say, the only time I think I ever eat radishes are at Korean restaurants. Oh yes, properly spicy that is. Cucumber has traditionally been my favourite and it's pretty good here. And finally the cabbage which is the most famous type of cabbage. Mm, yeah. Now they were all pretty good but rather surprisingly the radish was the winner. That's almost never my favourite but today it is the winner out of the three kimchis. Belly pork time now. Pretty good. But I think that needs a wrap because it was cooked plain and not marinated. I think it'd be better with the bring onions, the hot sauce, and the lettuce. Now we're on to a bit of the veg, the mushroom. Rice time now, and this is piping hot, this is. Mm. Now I've had plenty of bibimbaps 
in Asia, Korea even, in Europe, in Britain. This is on the money, this one is. You can taste the meat, the veg, the rice, and that spicy pepper paste. A word of warning though, I tend to leave this to the end because you want to eat your meat and fill yourself on the carbs later. Having said that, it is worth a slurp. And finally, the squid, the prawns and the spicy chicken has been tossed on the barbecue. Can't wait to try them. And it's a bit fiddly, but these little bones at the end of the beef ribs are delectable. Meat close to the bone, always a good bet. Not sure which sauce this prawn belongs in, but I'm going to go for the spicy one, of course. Just a little bit of sauce, because I don't want to ruin the natural flavour. Mm. Now, time for the chicken. Mm. Not only spicy and flavoursome, but the waitress attending the barbecue has cooked them to exactly the right point, so it's cooked, yet still moist and juicy. Splendiferous matanistas. Finally, the squid. Tasty, but needs some sauce, or a bit of kimchi, actually. Now, last time I had a Korean squid dish, it was coated in spices, and one of the spiciest things I've eaten. So we'd better try and replicate that with a bit of kimchi. And it's soft, tender, not rubbery. They obviously deal and trade in fresh seafood, which is very important, of course, especially when you're cooking it this way. I think you've got the gist of this now, Matanista, so I'm going to crack on with this and I'll see you in the pub for a little bit of football talk. Wow, wow, wow. I'm going back there again. That was such a good lunch. Now, I'm going to bring you the pre-match chat from the street because I don't have time for a pre-match pint. Might slip one in at the stadium. But, unfortunately, there's bad news on the injury front for City today. Johnny Stone's still out. Kevin De Bruyne out long term. Matteo Kovacic, another injury. And so the same for Jack Grealish. So I'm not saying we're down to bare bones, but we can't afford too many more of these injuries. And if you remember, last time round, this was the first game of the season. And Pep Guardiola did catch David Moyes out with the way his fullbacks operated. West Ham played a bit too high. Erling Haaland was allowed to run into spaces, which virtually nobody allows him to do now so I think this is going to be a tighter game. Quite difficult to predict a scoreline here but I think City will win but probably by a goal. Okay might be by two goals and West Ham have managed to draw at home to City. I don't think City are going to slaughter them today. And as I speak heading to Tottenham Court Road Station the team news is out and very briefly I'll tell you that West Ham are as expected that City played Doker and Foden. Only one holder in Rodri Alvarez and Haaland and something resembling our usual back four, so an attacking lineup from Guardiola. Okay, we always attack, but this one's especially attacking. Let's get to the stadium. Now talking about boiling your coolies off. That is as hot a chew bribe as I can ever remember having. I'm gonna get a bottle of water. Must have lost a couple of kilos in sweat. Well, I'm having to take on a bottle of water because that was ridiculous, that was. I don't know why people travel at the same time as football. Sure, you can get caught by it once if you don't know, but surely not a second time. Might have time for a pre-match pint inside the stadium or a swift half, but what I would say is that City have to be a bit careful here. If you remember Brighton against West Ham, they caught Brighton on the counter-attack several times, almost a cockney mugging, so we've got to be careful here. And if you remember last year, I had to actually buy a home end ticket. I behaved myself, of course. But the West Ham fans were so hospitable. Not only did they help me with information like directions, told me all about the local food like the jelly deals, and to add vinegar to it, but they also bought me a couple of drinks. So if, and like last year, I can go to the home fixture, I'll try hard to reciprocate.
But after a lot of pissing about, I had a genuine ticket, didn't scan. Eventually their supporter services on the other side of the ground helped me out. So I didn't get in until seven minutes into the game. Thankfully I've not missed a goal. No! Half an hour in, and I could have arrived half an hour late. Really, not much has happened. City have had a couple of chances at the Harland header, and then Foden's shot being deflected wide. West Ham a couple of good crosses to nobody because they didn't have the men forward. So it's going to be hard work this one. Control from Doku, set the winger free. We never got control of the ball after that. Ball crossed over nicely to James Ward Prowse. You don't associate him with goals with his head, but he did have it well. West Ham won City nil. Really not that much in the game. City have had a few chances. I think Haaland might have finished a bit better. But at the end of the day, when they had their one chance, James Ward-Prowse put it away. Jeremy Doku clearly at fault. I know he's bedding into the team, but I kind of expect players who play for this club to have better first-time control than that. And yes, he nearly made amends, sliding the ball over beautifully after beating his man, which I'd like to see him doing more, at least attempt to do so. And then at the end, Carl Walker overlapped beautifully, wasn't put in. The game is still entirely winnable, of course. It's got to be sharper at the business end of the pitch. I'm sure Pep will sort them out at half time. And whether we do go on and turn this game around, who knows? I also don't fancy my chances of a pint unless my friends got one for me. Okay, got a quick pint. Let's hope that City can prize open those tight spaces. West Ham are not giving much space, marking people closely, but we got through a couple of times. Let's hope we get through again and finish the end product. Yeah! Oh, bollocks, I missed the goal in the first minute of the second half having this bloody pint.
just over an hour in and City have said a lot of promise, had some great chances after the equaliser. Doku seems to have a box of tricks in him. But we keep giving the ball away cheaply and that's where they're dense. They've had a couple of good chances, good saves needed for Madison and they've got James Ward Prowse, a dead ball expert, so we've got to be careful. So glad to be settled down to another pint of best after another blisteringly hot tube journey. But I will say in fairness, a bit like Wembley, West Ham process depends out pretty quickly. Anyway, my assessment of that game is that City made rather heavy weather of it. West Ham basically scored with their first shot on target, I think. Their counter-attack was pretty good, but don't forget Doku miscontrolled the ball to play them in in the first place. But even in the first half, City missed a couple of gilt-edged chances. We equalised just after half-time. Sorry, I was still at the bar at that stage. But after that, West Ham had a couple of chances to go back ahead. Again, caused by sloppy relinquishing of the possession in key areas in our own half. That was basically what they were set up to try and do, to try and, to try and bust the spell of City possession and steal the ball high up the pitch. It was the only way they were going to score, really, other than maybe a set piece from the talented feet of James Ward-Prowse. Other than those two chances, City really did take command. They got a grip in the second half. And even though I'm not a massive expert on this, Guardiola pushed forward Kyle Walker and made sure that the midfield were trampling all over West Ham whenever they got the ball. So for a sustained 
same time in that second half, West Ham didn't get a sniff, and if they did get the ball, they were pinned so far back that they couldn't do anything with it. And eventually the pressure did tell. I thought Jeremy Doku had a big bag of tricks he could play and caused a lot of problems for the West Ham defence. You could probably say he atoned for his error earlier in the game. And given our squad is stretched rather thin at the moment with all these injuries, I thought we did pretty well overall. The third goal was a luscious counter-attack finished off by Erling Haaland. The second goal, a dainty little lob, I think, by Julian Alvarez to Bernardo Silva to finish it and loft the ball over the keeper. Two really well-worked goals. So at least we found our attacking teeth in the second half. Our new signing, Nunes, came on. Really play enough minutes for me to be able to assess him properly or for anybody else to assess him for that matter. Looking forward to the next one, which will be Red Star of Belgrade at home on Tuesday. But until then, please remember to keep liking, keep sharing, keep subscribing. Tell your friends about me, please. But most of all, don't forget, you can't beat a bit of mutton.